Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Isu Kim, and I would like to talk about enhancing observability in cloud-based educational Linux lab environment. And th since this is my first time speaking in front of such uh, amazing people, I'm very nervous right now, but I'll just try my best. So before I start, I would like to quickly introduce about me and my lab. As I have mentioned earlier, my name is Isu Kim, and I'm from Dangung University, located in South Korea. And I'm currently a undergraduate student in mobile OS lab, and currently my research topics uh, lies on cloud observabilities. To be, to be more specific, um, I'm interested in systems monitoring and distributed tracing as well. And a quick uh, introduction about our lab. As our lab's name indicates, uh, we used to focus on Android operating systems, how, uh, such as Andro oh, mobile operating systems such as Androids. However, in recent days, we have been expanding our research topics to the following things. So that was pretty much about me and our lab, so let's get started. So the first topic is that um, I would like to discuss is the need of cloud for education. In this section, I'm going to talk about why we wanted to build a cl uh, cloud, cloud for education ourselves. So in our university, we have various coursework uh, from systems programming, operating systems, network programming, which is just a socket programming, and to modifying and like compiling Android OSs. Uh, and all of those involves in modi uh, using Linux lab environments. Uh, to be more specific, uh, we need lots of physical or virtual computers with Linux environments for students. Uh, to provide such a large number of computers, we have tried uh, some method as, as uh, listed below. And from the next slide, I'm going to talk about like pros and cons of each uh, approaches. First, uh, first approach is using single board computers such as Raspberry Pis, and they are um, extremely good because we are handing out a physical Linux machine, so students can have a hands-on experience on inst from installing to like doing hard hardware uh, some uh, actions without restrictions. However, in recent days, since Raspberry Pis price is kind of skyrocketing and providing uh, some extra accessories to students are quite expensive. That was one problem. And uh, keeping track of physical devices are quite um, demanding for uh, human efforts and times as well. So we have tried the next method, which is uh, telling and making students install virtual machines in their environments. Uh, the main advantage of using virtual machines is that uh, we do not have to provide anything. So that, that means there is no cost for us. And the second advantage of using a virtual machine is that students can recover from their failures or mistakes easily by using um, snapshots. However, since the virtual machines heavily depend on the students' uh, computers or laptops, um, there are some students who cannot afford those luxuries, uh, meaning that some students can barely meet those uh, re hardware requirements, and those inequalities are not ideal for our environment since we are teaching students how to use them. So the last thing that we have tried is uh, using a public cloud, and we have been renting some public cloud instances and letting students use them. Uh, the good thing about using the public cloud is that they provide easy management over lots of machines, like hundreds of students at once. And the second thing is that they provide public IP addresses. That means that students can host like a service or perform like some network actions, and that's not limited. However, the problem is that they are a lot pricey compared to other solutions. Uh, and since we are paying money over time, but we are not getting anything out of it, like in a, it's not a good solution in the long term. So with those, so with those uh, backgrounds, we have, uh, we have thought about building a cloud for education for ourselves. As we were uh, trying to build 
cloud system ourselves, uh, the basic requirements were like shared as the clouds that would be normally in the production environment, such as like we also require extensibility, flexibility, and scalability, and security, and so on. However, since we were building our cloud on top of uh, our university's IT infrastructure, we had some more requirements uh, than those in the production environment. The first thing is that uh, we need a virtualized Linux environment per student. And since we were not able to provide each student a physical server or, or a physical machine, all students have to share a limited number of hardware resources. As you can see in the picture, my left, your right, uh, we got just one rack of server with 10 uh, server, so that's kind of limited. Also, since we were uh, sharing those hardware resources, that meant we need uh, isolation between students. Also, since we are uh, required to manage uh, lots of students, like 40, 100 plus students at once, like to register and delete those accounts, we need simple man management tools. And the second thing is that uh, we needed uh, controlled entry points into the system. In our university, we have been assigned with a number of available public IP addresses. That means that uh, we were an, unable to provide each student a public IP for their accesses. And uh, besides that, we had uh, extra limitation and uh, school policy for security concerns, uh, which specifically meant that we were not allowed to open like any ports to students. For example, if we were to open some specific port like 25565 TCP, we had to get permission from our IT department. So we required a limited and controlled entry points into the cloud system. And last but not least, uh, we were required to have an enhanced observability within the cloud system. Since our resource pool was not enough, we had to take a deep monitoring into the shared ut resource utilization. All, this also required us to monitor each student's detailed activities in, within their uh, virtualized environment. And I'm going to discuss in the later sections because this is the most important part. So with those requirements, we have created an overview of our cloud infrastructure and architecture. And that consists, that consists of SSH gateway, HTTPS ingresses for students access, and management tools or admins to create and delete those virtual machines or containers. As well as um, an observability tool for each component, including the physical, physical infrastructure. From now on, we are going to talk about the first requirement, which was providing a virtualized environment per student. Um, as we were running on self-hosted uh, and bare metal environment, the first option that we came into our mind was OpenStack. Uh, OpenStack we, uh, is great, but it has like, like lots of features. However, however those uh, luxury features were kind of overspec for our requirements. And to support those features, they used up uh, significant amount of resources, which were kind of concern, uh, one of our concerns. Also, uh, to be more specific, their uh, complex network topologies were quite um, um, challenging for us to, man um, to proper properly set up and manage. And since um, OpenStack is running inside a, a virtual machine, the observability choices were quite limited as well. Meanwhile, um, um, Kubernetes offered basic and simple building blocks, such as pods and deployments and persistent volumes. It was um, especially handful since it was very easy to set up and manage the whole cluster. And um, since, uh, compared to OpenStack, Kubernetes tend to have a lightweight resource usages as well. And since Kubernetes was running on top of co containerized environments, they offer a wide range of observability choices. So for our requirement, Kubernetes was better suited for our uh, job. Oh, yep. So with those Kubernetes components, as you can see in the picture, 
uh, we were able to provide a virtualized uh, Linux environment which runs on SSH, uh, Visual Studio Code, and Note a Jupyter Notebook server as a service. Um, also, in Kubernetes, in Kubernetes uh, those pods migrate across uh, servers. And to pres preserve our user data inside those containers, uh, such as like on a home directory of a user, we have utilized a persistent volume which is at attached to an NFS or a storage background, uh, back, back end. Also, uh, lastly, we have created a simple uh, tool which can deploy all those uh, required Kubernetes uh, re resources using Kubernetes ap ap API as well. So with this, uh, the student was able to um, have a SSH environment and some online ID environments. And the second part is controlled entry points. This is um, this part is quite straightforward. And the first thing that we had to offer was a single SSH gateway, which forwards SSH connections to virtualized environment by users' names. For example, as seen in the picture, uh, Alice and Bob both, both connect to the same entry point, which is dangook.cloud, but with different usernames. However, the SSH connections should be sent to different services within the Kubernetes cluster. For this, we have um, set up a proxy and a load balancer for exposing IP addresses inside our um, private network, which is our university network. Also, since we had lots of uh, SSH login attempts, like, which is like for hacking, we also required a firewall service as well, and that blocks malicious accesses to the uh, cloud as well. So that was the first part, and the second part is an HTTPS ingress. Since we were going to offer some Visual Studio Code service, and a Git, uh, which is like a GitHub online editor, and a Jupyter Notebook service, just like a Google's Colab, uh, we had to have a HTTPS ingress, which exposes our services into our students. However, this um, part is quite like conventional, and this is like used in most of the production environment. So we are not going to talk too much deeply about this. In short, uh, we were utilizing reverse proxies from Nginx for our ingresses. So uh, that was uh, pretty much. Um, our overall architecture for the environment. And by using those two uh, components, we were able to build a cloud for education. Uh, let's just watch a simple uh, demonstration video. Oh. Oh. No, I'll just play. So as you can see in the left, as you can see in the right, those are different usernames. The first one is uh, ends with JP00, and the second thing ends with uh, 01. And they will both connect to the cloud, and they will be first asked to change the passwords by force, and that's quite long, so I will just skip it. So the second user will log in as well, and we offer a, a uh, online web services as well, the Visual Studio Code, which works like a GitHub code. Yep, that was the first one. And the second user will use a Jupyter Notebook online service, just like a Google's Colab. Yes, that was pretty much all of the uh, features within our cloud environment. Yes. So the third thing that was required was enhanced observabilities, uh, which is a big topic for us. And from now on, I'm going to tell why observability within our cloud environment was uh, the most important thing. 
So the first question is that why do we need observability within our cloud environment? Uh, the first reason is that uh, we are using a limited resources. And this is quite straightforward because like in the production environment as well, we'll uh, do such monitoring to optimize their uh, hardware or like some other resources. However, the second reason is quite like um, characteristic, I guess. And since we are mainly target targeting our service cloud services for students, and students are in a learning stage, uh, meaning that students are pretty much immature administrators. So some, I'll just provide some motivating examples and sharing some cases which happened in the production environment for us as well. Uh, the first scenario is that students are burning up operating system resources. For example, a student A was spawning too much or too many processes in the server. Uh, we teach multi-processing and multi-threading in some classes, such as uh, operating systems and network uh, programming. To be more, uh, to, oh yeah. However, uh, students are not quite uh, familiar with the concept of a, uh, of a process and threads, which um, they have to program. So they have difficulty in managing like specifically the child processes and tr threads as well. And this, the, these problems uh, eventually leads to students forgetting to kill child processes and like make lots of zombie processes. And due to this, uh, the operating system's resources are, are being used too much. Students will use like some system calls such as fork or clone to create or uh, create a process or a thread and this uh, affects the host since the containers are, are sharing the kernel with the host as well. And the second thing is there are a limited number of processes that can be spawned in a machine and that just is an example of the first reason as well. Uh, the picture in the right, yeah, right, uh, is an image that um, in during our operating system co systems course, um, Lots of students fail to manage those uh, child processes like effectively. So we got hundreds of processes and taking almost like 97% of our CPU usages. So that was the uh, first reason. And the second reason is that they are burning up uh, resource, uh, hardware resources. Um, there was a student B who tried to find a hash collision by writing random hashes into a file until it collides. So he was quite unlucky and he had to write over 90 plus gigabytes to find a hash collision. So in this case, uh, there are two problems within this scenario. And the first one is that it is uh, the students or like the hardware resources to be specifically are using CPU resources. For example, if we were to just create an infinite loop without any like system calls or other things, it will take um, lots of CPU time as well. Also, like combined with the first scenario, uh, let's just imagine what will happen if we have like unmanaged multi-threads and unmanaged multi-processing con uh, connected to a infinite loop. Uh, and Yes, this can be easily solved by using some features in Kubernetes such as limits from re requests, uh, requests. However, the next problem is quite difficult to deal with. Uh, the next problem is IO resources. Since we were using networked uh, storage, which is an NFA server, there were limited bandwidth and lots of uh, traffic being shared meaning that we have to share traffic between NFS server and a physical server that's running the pod and the, the capabilities of the network switch as well. And um, also, yes, we can just create a limit of size that can be written to a persistent volume using a Kubernetes uh, resource, uh, persistent volume specs. However, um, Ah. However, those does not uh, avoid from users 
uh, taking up lots of IO resources, meaning that some would just write and delete and write and delete, write and delete to a single file, and that's just counted as a, just one file, and that's not being controlled at all. And also the security issues were another scenario. And the first one is that students do not usually know what they're executing. They just copy and paste some random shells from internet without verifying. And this can lead to potentially security problems, which, uh, which to be more specific, we had uh, cryptojacking, which is like somebody entering into the system and finding cryptocurrencies and sending, in, sending them to their wallets. That was one. And the second thing is that we are getting lots of SSH uh, logins uh, per day. So due to those three scenarios, we require enhanced observability within our cloud system as well. Uh, so we now know that we need a enhanced observability and the next thing is that we have to define those requirements for the observability solutions. The, and those narrow down to three topics mainly. Uh, the first thing is uh, real-time resource usage monitoring. Uh, and this is quite conventional for um, conventional requirements for observability. And we require cluster level usage monitoring views such as CPU memory and IO usage per containers as well. The second thing was detailed insights within each con virtualized environment. Uh, we need to monitor users' activities inside containers. And by those users' activities, uh, those include system calls within, uh, system calls and events within hosts as well. And this was the biggest requirement. And you know, this was the, considered one of the biggest requirements that we had. Uh, the third thing is minimize performance overhead. Since we are running low on resources and do not have a dedicated platform for observability, we require sharing those resources while running the servers, like running those uh, virtualized environments as well. Um, this especially is required for both uh, collecting system information in the cloud as well as visualizing and querying those information. So those three requirements uh, that we have looked for, uh, uh, my bad. So, with those three requirements, we have looked for possible options and combinations for observ observability. To be more specific, we required a two-level uh, observability using two different combinations of system, uh, system observability tools. First, we needed an overview, resource usage, and the second thing that we needed was a detailed insights within each component. So with, uh, for real-time metric-based monitoring, we have deployed a Prometheus and Grafana combination. And as pretty much lots of people know, this is uh, quite, uh, quite used a lot in other Kubernetes cluster as well. And since Prometheus is said to be optimized for storing high-frequency metric collection, this was uh, especially suitable for like real-time CPU and memory and IO usage for the cluster information as, as uh, effectively. On the other hand, for detailed insights within um, each component, we have selected EBPF and ELK stack were an Elastic Stack. And since Elastic Stack was optimized for log, and log analysis and troubleshooting as well as some machine learning features for anomaly detections, this was a quite great combination. Also, in terms of performance, uh, ELK stack is said to be optimized for large number of log data as well. So with those two combinations, two level of observabilities, we were able to uh, achieve um, higher level of observability as well. The first thing is that the first combination, which is Fuentes and Grafana, was quite uh, used for node uh, retrieving like multiple metrics, such as uh, 
the hardware resource usages inside a Kubernetes worker and uh, collecting some metrics for each containers inside those Kubernetes using the Kube API. So with those two collectors, Prometheus does a metric pooling and stores them into a centralized database. And also we have also set up an alert system which is fired when a specified uh, amount of resource in the cluster has been used and or some pod is using up too much resources and like all those kind of stuff. Also with using Grafana, we can visualize uh, those real time and time, time series data like a graph that I'll, I'm going to show you in the later slide. So as you can see in the, this slide, uh, this was our two hour programming exam which took like a few months ago. And in those programming exam sessions, we had over 50 students just actively accessing the whole, whole service as well. So in this scenario, uh, Prometheus and Grafana has proven that it is quite great at uh, monitoring and observing those uh, real-time resource usages as well. So the next thing was eVPF and ELK stack. And uh, before I dive into the second thing, I'll just like to have a small time introducing eVPF. EVPF uh, stands for Extended Berkeley Packet Filter. And as I'm guessing, there will be some people in this room who has heard of EVPF or has actual like, experiences using EVPF as well. So it basically extends cap capabilities of Linux kernel in runtime. This means that you, don't, you do not have to modify the kernel source code or make uh, Linux mo uh, kernel modules at all. And in recent days, uh, eBPF is quite used a lot in production environment for especially observability collection, tracing applications and troubleshooting with debugging, and also enforcing security context uh, to a runtime, uh, container runtime as well. So for us to use eBPF in the Kubernetes cluster, we had to have uh, some multiple eBPF agents running inside each uh, nodes and collecting those uh, in, system, in system logs and later send them to a centralized database. Uh, this was quite uh, easy, easily um, solved by using Tetragon. Tetragon is a eBPF security, uh, eBPF based security observability and runtime enforcement tool, and it can perform security events with, um, uh, it can collect security events with Kubernetes aware context meaning that it's capable of identi identifying a pod and its namespace when uh, there is some like a process running inside a host as uh, eBPF collects. Also, uh, Tetragon exports those logs as a well-known format and um, we, with using those well-known formats, we are able to further export those data into our ELK stack or something else. So that was a brief introduction about eVPF and I'll dive into the second part. Um, so with eVPF and Tetragon, which is the same thing, uh, not, not the same thing, but e Tetragon and eVPF and with ELK combined, we can collect detailed system logs by eVPF in Tetragon and store those logs using Elasticsearch and visualize them using the Kibana, which is just an ELK stack. So as shown in the picture below, Tetragon collects system information like a JSON and we had to bridge that part and after that, that's what, that was quite straightforward. So I'm going to show you a small demo, but those were three scenarios that we were trying to uh, demonstrate, but unfortunately EVPF uh, for, and Tetragon was limited for uh, has limited support for uh, monitoring user space and uh, user activities in user spaces. So we are quite not prepared for that one. So I'm going to, I'm just going to demonstrate the first one and the third one.
So the right side of the terminal is a tetragon agent, which uh, tetragon monitor, which uh, collects live data from those containers. And as you can see, uh, I have made a CRL uh, curl request to that specific IP. And sh as shown in the right picture, we can pretty much monitor that it's uh, actually connecting a TCP connection and receiving such uh, information, uh, re receiving traffic from it. And for example, let's uh, do another thing, which is Ah, yep. Creating a random file using dd, and by using th that command, as you, as it's writing file to disk. It in the tetragon part, we can see that uh, it is actually connecting to the NFS server and writing those files as well. And since we were quite difficult to see those inf information in just uh, terminal environment, we have exported them to the Elasticsearch part. So as shown in the uh, video, we can pretty much see that some binaries are being, oh, that was too fast. Binaries are being executed with some arguments and, and type of a system calls. As you can see in the right, there is uh, x64 syswrite, which is a system write system call, and the context it was like requested on. And for the network information, we can also see those network information since uh, the network are basically are using those uh, system calls. As you can see, there are uh, source IP addresses and destination IP addresses for a specific container as well. So basically that was the first part and the second part that uh, as I have mentioned earlier, we have lots of processes being not managed properly. So I have, I'm going to drop a fork bomb using bash command and it will trigger lots of system calls as shown in the right side uh, as well as the SSH one. And it's creating lots of processes. And since, yep. So basically that was another example of monitoring those system calls as well. Yep. Ah, I'm sorry. And the third thing was failed SSH logins, as we are getting lots of SSH logins per day, which are basically trying to sneak into our system. The first right terminal will log in as my administer account, and we'll be doing a tail minus F for uh, observing those SSH logins. The right part, I'm going to um, use the SSH and connect it with like wrong credentials. Uh, I'll just do it three times and that was it. And after that, we can visualize that using the ELK stack. As seen here, we can see OSS Japan, which was uh, connecting, was not properly connected as well. So that was the second part. So with using those two uh, combinations, we are quite, quite able to achieve such, uh, such observabilities as well. So for conclusion, um, I'm going to talk about like small achievements that we have made and our uh, goals for the future as well. Um, we were able to con uh, construct a cloud-based uh, lab using Kubernetes and we provided access to virtualized uh, Linux environment per user using controlled entry points in the system, which we talked before. And we also uh, constructed a management tool which can deploy lots of users at once. And we were able to achieve lots of observabilities as shown like, in, like before. And the further uh, challenges ahead. Um, however, there were lots of extra challenges. The first one was the storage problem. 
since we are relying our user data on a net network storage, which basically is a NAS with H hard disk drive, the performance overhead and performance degradation is quite high. Uh, the graph on your right top side is just for your reference, and we did a simple FIO benchmark for writing and reading some random files. And as you can see, the blue side is native storage, which uh, our server runs in. Uh, yep, and the red thing is the part when we try to write a file into a pod which is mounted to the NFS. So as you can see, the, the, the performance degradation is quite high. And also, as mentioned before, since we are sharing the network traffic inside a single cluster, the amount that we are trying to use for the NFS is taking up the traffic that should be uh, shared with those uh, Kubernetes nodes as well. And we have too many duplicated files. As I have mentioned earlier, we teach some courses with Android operating systems as well. We modify them and compile them, so we have to have the full source code available. And as you can see in the graph below, we have lots of uh, Android files and less amount of user data in here. So we have to deal with those duplicated files because students just modify a small bit of part and just share lots of same files as well. So that was one problem. And the second problem that we had was containers are very basically sharing kernels. So we were unable to support kernel programming or like some system CTL commands to each student. And since uh, the kernel is being shared by the uh, container and the host, using hardware requires privileged containers and privileged uh, pods, which are not uh, ideal in Kubernetes environment. So we are currently working on virtualized machine VM-based Kubernetes extension, which is called Koi Cloud. And we are also working on enhancing observabilities within virtual machines as well. So that was a brief uh, further challenges. And for future works, we are, go of course, going to work on Im improving the cloud system and mitigating such challenges, as well as the virtualized machine-based uh, Kubernetes extension as well. And for security, we are trying to create a platform for enhanced security. And as we can just simply observe, but we cannot take action. So we are trying to perform some security enhancement or enforcement, which can be triggered on the fly. Um, so we are trying to make a real-time kernel level container security enforcement, such as using LS and BPFs. And also we are working on inter-container causalities with distributed tracing, meaning that some container triggered another container to take action and the another container was uh, required to do some other jobs. And also uh, an anomaly detection and intrusion, intrusion detection using machine learning technologies as well. And also besides those, since we were focusing on enhancing observability, we had uh, privacy and less priority. And also the confidential data that students might be holding inside their containers. So we are trying to uh, provide enhanced observability, but at the same time, um, preserve those like privacy issues as well. So yep, it, it ends the pre presentation and I was so nervous and thanks everyone for listening. And I would gladly take questions here or outside this hall as well. Thank you so much. First of all, I think uh, it was a great presentation, so um, I couldn't tell you are nervous at all. Um, so you use observability more of a reactive uh, approach as of right now, and I think it's, it's great. Are you looking uh, to use it as a feedback loop to some actions um, 
to as a feedback loop uh, to be more proactive? Um, are you asking us if we are trying to build a platform that kind of feeds into the system and like determines which is wrong and right? So, for example, um, like you, you mentioned the resource, uh, the resource utilization, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, technically, it's a metric. You can use that metric to trigger some kind of automation to either put resource limits or kick out the, the pod okay. out of the, uh, the cluster. Uh, are you looking into that? Uh, for now, we're just doing a rule-based uh, approach, but in the future, we are trying to do like what you are uh, trying to say, like those kind of like food, uh, um, what can I say, like positive feedbacks, like feedback loops, like depending on the like past data, we are trying to improve those like rule-based actions as well as like those kind of things that you have mentioned. Hello, thanks for your sharing. So you mentioned you use eBPF to minimize the performance impact. So have you done some benchmark on this performance impact? How much is it? Uh, yes, we have uh, internally performed like multiple tests using eBPF. For example, um, um, I cannot remember the exact number, but by using uh, LSM BPF, we were able to have like nine to 11% degradation, uh, we have optimized poorly, but just for reference, that's one number. And by using like K probes or trace points, we can get like lower than that number as well. So that's kind of a, uh, a number that we can kind of like ignore as a performance overhead. And that's kind of bearable for us. So yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone again and have a nice day.